The section of Ephesians in which we find ourselves in these Sunday evenings deals with Christian relationships. And we are this evening at the beginning of chapter 6, and you will know that these relationships apply particularly to three special spheres. To marriage in the first place at which we looked last Sunday evening, to the home in the second place in chapter 6 verses 1 to 4, and to the whole realm of our daily work, which I believe is what is intended for us from verse 5 to the end of verse 9. Now, there are two things that we need to bear in mind as we think about all of these relationships as a general background. One is that Paul is here certainly continuing to describe what he spoke about in chapter 5, verse 18, that is, being filled with the Holy Spirit. And the Spirit-filled life is the life that he now goes on to describe in terms of these three different relationships. In other words, the place where you demonstrate being filled with the Spirit is not in some remote, detached, ivory tower of spiritual existence, but in the humdrum business of the daily relationships within marriage, within the family, and at your daily work. Second thing that we need to bear in mind is that all three of these relationships have as their common bond the doctrine of submission. That is a primary submission to Christ. Secondly, a general submission to one another in humble-mindedness, as the New Testament calls it. And thirdly, a particular submission in these three areas from which the Apostle is going to illustrate. Wives submitting to their husbands, children submitting to their parents, and servants submitting to their masters. This is introduced in verse 21, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Now this evening we come to the second specific area where this submission is to be exercised and where we are to demonstrate a distinctive pattern of life as Christians because we are filled with the Holy Spirit, and that is in the realm of family relationships, children and parents relating to each other. And we are going to consider just verses 1 to 4 of this chapter this evening. If you picked up a sheet with our intended outline, you will see that we have departed from it again, and I will return to the work relationships of servant and master next Sunday evening. Now, you may perhaps think as you come to this, as some were suggesting to me last weekend, perhaps the relationships of husband and wives refer specifically and peculiarly to those who are married. Let me underline to you again this evening that the great relationship to which the marriage bond points is the relationship between Christ and ourselves as His church. Marriage is a shadow, that is the reality. If you are a child of God, you have the reality whether or not you have the shadow. And it's an important thing to learn from the shadow and from Paul's teaching about that for the sake of our right understanding of the, re the reality. But this evening, all of us are children. That would be an undisputed proposition, I would imagine. All of us in one form or another, are children of our parents. Many of us are parents of children. Many of us who are not parents of children one day will be. Some of us who may come into neither of these categories, either present or potential parents, certainly have an influence over young people in all sorts of different ways. And here is the biblical teaching on the relationship that ought to exist within the Christian family. I think it's interesting and significant at the very beginning to notice that children were present in the church when this apostolic letter was read. You can picture the situation where Paul 
begins towards the end of the letter to address specific classes of people. And so he turns to wives and husbands, children and parents, slaves and masters, and they are present there when the letter is publicly read. And it's a significant thing that they are here as an integral part of the fellowship. That, incidentally, is by itself a radical change from the attitude to children which obtained in the ancient world. Jesus' approach to children was really quite revolutionary, you know, when he said, let the children come to me. Do not hinder them, for to such belongs the children, the kingdom of God. And even more remarkably, in Matthew chapter 18, do you notice that revolutionary attitude to children which Jesus exemplifies when he teaches his disciples, Matthew 18, 2, he called a little child and had him stand among them and he said, I tell you the truth, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever welcomes a little child like this in my name welcomes me. And then this. Now in a society where children were abused as they were, in an extraordinary way, listen to this. If anyone causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a large millstone hung around his neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. Now here is an attitude to children which the apostle is exhibiting to us which belongs to another world altogether from the ancient world into which this came as a light into darkness. Now you will notice the injunction that the apostle gives to children. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. That is the attitude of children to their parents in a Christian home. The way they are to relate to their, their parents is to be an attitude of obedience. They are to be submitted to the authority of their parents, and that is a simple, straightforward commandment, and it's as clear as daylight. It clearly implies, of course, that parents are to provide an authoritative, which is not the same as an authoritarian, leadership within the home and within the family. And their leadership is to be directive, not suggesting but directing their children. There has to be something, in other words, to be obeyed. And one assumes that this is a direction which is given within the formative years of childhood, within what we would call a child's minority. But the injunction is very clear and really requires no elaboration. There is a laid upon Christian children in Christian homes and indeed upon all children by the law of God, as we shall see in a moment, to obey their parents and a duty correspondingly laid upon parents to exercise headship and leadership over their children within their home. So the training up of a child is not to be in self-pleasing or primarily in self-expression, but in a self-discipline which will learn to submit to his or her parents. Now, you will notice the qualification that is added by the apostle. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. But the qualification is in the Lord. 
And clearly the apostle adds that for a very specific reason, and we need to be careful about this. And I think that Christian young people in non-Christian homes need to be particularly careful about this because the issue often arises. While I am still subject to my parents and living under their care and within their home and family, and they are not Christians and I am a Christian, how can I obey my parents without sometimes disobeying the Lord? Now, it's a very important issue for many people. Let me just say a word about that at this point, because I think we need to be exceedingly careful. And I think one of the things that Christian young people need to do in a non-Christian home environment is to lean over backwards to obey their parents in every way that is possible to do so because it may well be one of the primary ways in which you witness to them. If this is one of the evidences of being filled with the Spirit, and if being filled with the Spirit is exhibiting the Lord Jesus, who was subject to his parents, although they were filled with misunderstanding about him, then one of the tasks of children, Christian children, within a non-Christian home, is to do everything in their power in order to obey their parents. But I think it is abundantly true also that if your parents are inciting you in some sense to disobey God, for example, to prevent you from worshipping him, then you will need to think that out in consultation with an older and wiser Christian. But there are very few areas, I would suggest to you, where it is not possible for a Christian young person to obey their parents in the Lord. Let me say to you that there is one example that comes to my mind. From time to time, Christian young people who have newly come to faith in Christ come to see me and say that they are persuaded that they ought to confess Christ in baptism. And their parents have forbidden them. Now, I believe that that is the sort of situation where you can obey the Lord since you are able to postpone baptism without in any sense endangering your own soul, that is one of the areas where I think Christian young people should lean over backwards to obey their parents. And I think you will far more likely witness to them and win them by doing so than by disobeying them. Our very willing, loving obedience may be one of our most vital witnesses. So that is the condition that is attached, but it is a condition, and there are some young people who have had to come to terms with this in the most painful way. But look now at the reasons the apostle gives us for this commandment. One of them do you notice, is embedded in the natural order of right and wrong and good and evil. That is what he is saying when he says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. He is saying that there are certain areas where right and wrong are clear-cut issues. It is therefore right to obey your parents and wrong to disobey them. And Paul sets it down as a duty, not because it is profitable or because it is a good evangelistic method within your home, but because it is right. And there are some things which are always and universally right because that is the natural order as God has created it. He would sometimes challenge us, does not nature itself teach you this? And it would be 
universally wrong to depart from it. It's a very significant thing, for example, have you ever noticed that in that awful catalogue of a decadent society in Romans chapter 1, Paul includes disobedience to parents. He brings this ghastly catalogue of the kind of immorality that belonged to the gutter of life in ancient Rome. And in the middle of that there is found disobedient to parents. And what he is saying is that within this utterly godless catalogue of disorder and disobedience to God and to everything that is natural, there comes this whole issue of disobedience to parents. But obedience and honor to parents is so important that it's found not only in the natural order of what is right, it is also found in the supernatural revelation of God's plans for men and women's lives in his law revealed on Sinai to Moses. And that's why he goes on in verse 2, Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. Now that is the fifth commandment. And what Paul is saying, do you see, is that he buttresses this argument in two ways. Obedience to parents belongs to the natural order. It is common right and justice that you should live like this. But it also belongs to God's order, to God's specific plans for his redeemed people. When he brought them up out of Egypt, he gave them laws for living. Now, a very significant thing about this law is that it is, as you will probably know, the fifth commandment. Now, the fifth commandment comes at the end of the first table of commandments as the Jews divided them. You will know that they divided them into two sets or tables of five each. And the first five were concerned with our duty to God, the second with our duty to each other. And the problem many people have is they say, but this fifth commandment is surely not our duty to God. It's our duty to other people. It's a social responsibility that we might obey our parents. But there's a very interesting and significant thing here. And that is that this occurs within the section of commandments that give to us the relationship of the redeemed believer with God because it is part of our duty to God that we should honor and obey our parents. And I'm sure this is because they represent God to us in our childhood. Have you ever thought of that? that one of the solemn responsibilities of parents is that in a child's childhood, parents, as it were, represent God to them. We are mediators in a very real sense of his authority and of his love. Do you remember how earlier on in Ephesians in chapter 3 and verse 15 we found Paul kneeling before the Father from whom the whole family in heaven and on earth derives its name. And I translated that to you on that occasion, from whom all fatherhood in heaven and on earth derives its name. Now that's precisely because human fatherhood is a reflection of divine fatherhood. Divine fatherhood is the reality, human fatherhood is the shadow. As in the case of marriage, our marriage to the Lord Jesus as our bridegroom is the reality, human marriage is the shadow. So in both cases, you have a reality and a shadow, and it is so bound up with God's relationship with us that the Jews place this commandment in the first table. Now, do you notice how this is 
consistently done throughout the Old Testament. In Leviticus chapter 19, for example, verses 1 to 3, You shall be holy, God says, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. Every one of you, next sentence, every one of you shall revere his mother and his father, for I am the Lord your God. What is holiness? What is likeness to Christ? It is to be found here in revering your father and mother. And it is an integral part of our reverence for God. Hence the serious penalty in Leviticus chapter 20 for those who curse their parents or the stubborn and rebellious son who refused to obey them and defy discipline. The penalty, do you remember, in Leviticus chapter 20 is death. Now that's the solemnity with which God views a breach of this commandment. And Paul concentrates not on the penalty but on the blessings that are promised to those who thus honor their parents In the Lord, it probably applies that promise that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. It probably applies to us in terms of our spiritual well-being and of the social stability which undoubtedly comes into the life of man when there is a strong biblical godliness in family life. We cannot overrate this, my dear friends, and we ought to be amongst the vanguard of those who proclaim it and exhibit it in the world, that a strong biblical godliness in parent-child relationships is one of the secrets of stability in society. And it's a very interesting thing that when you see society crumbling round about us, you discover that here is one of the primary areas where the crumbling is evident. So there is the counsel to children. Obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment, with a promise that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. There is blessing promised by God for obedience to this commandment. Now the counsel to parents, verse 4 at the beginning. And although I think there is a significance, which I'll come to in a moment, in the addressing of fathers rather than father and mother together, clearly the mother is included in this address to parents. The significance of Paul addressing fathers may be because in the ancient world the Roman father was something of a despot. Let me read you an account of the Roman father and his position. A Roman father had absolute power over his family. He could sell them as slaves. He could make them work as his own slaves. He could make them work in his fields, even in chains. He could take the law into his own hands, for the law was in his own hands, and punish them as he liked. He could even inflict the death penalty on his child. He was an utter despot within his family and confirmed as such by Roman law. Now it may well be that again Paul is saying to Christian fathers whom he is addressing here, fathers, You are to be Christian in your relationships with your children. What will be the mark of being filled with the Holy Spirit as parents relating to their children? Well, what Paul is first appealing for is that while parents need to exercise authority, that they do not abuse it. So fathers, do not exasperate your children. Now, it is possible for parents to exasperate. One of the other translations has it, discourage. Another has, disable your children by the kind of relationship with them which is basically negative in its character. 
by the kind of nagging, carping criticism to which many children are constantly subjected, by an injustice in our dealings with them, by over-strictness and over-harshness and hardness which does not reflect the fatherhood of God. Perhaps above all, by disciplining them, not out of love, but out of anger. How many children have become the victim, even in Christian homes, I say to you this evening, of those who have disciplined their children because they needed to get their own anger out, not because the child had need of anything, but because they had need of something. And that is exasperating children. And it is denying God in the face of them. All physical discipline should be far more painful to the parent than it ever is to the child. Now, some of you are not yet parents. Many of you are, but I want to say to you this evening, and I say to you out of Scripture and out of no right that I have personally to speak, but I say to you that all physical discipline should be far more painful when it is necessary to the parent than to the child. And when we discipline or correct children out of a spirit of anger and the satisfying of our own bitterness of spirit towards them. And let us not say that we never experience it. I tell you, we are damaging them and denying God and the gospel. You perhaps would not expect me to call John Calvin to my support in this uh, Sense, but let me read to you the harsh, hard-hearted villain as he speaks about this. Parents in their turn, he says, are exhorted not to irritate their children with immoderate harshness. This would excite hatred and would lead them to throw off the yoke altogether. Accordingly, in Colossians, he adds, lest they be discouraged. Listen to this. This is John Calvin, the same Kind and liberal treatment keeps children in reverence for their parents and increases the readiness and cheerfulness of their obedience, while a hard and unkind severity rouses them to obstinacy and destroys their dutifulness. But Paul goes on to say, let them be kindly cherished. For the word ectrephine unquestionably conveys the idea of gentleness and friendliness, as John Calvin. And he is, of course, so right. Says the apostle, do not exasperate your children. And how we need to pray, I would suggest to you, you need to pray about this before you have children. How we need to pray that we may be given the grace to hear and heed what the apostle says. Instead of this, he says, bring them up in the training and instruction, the old phrase we used to read from the authorized version, the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. The significance of this realm of training, that's what a Christian home is to be. You see, it is to be a place of training. It is to be a school. It is to be a school of the love of God and the wisdom of God and the grace of God and the authority of God and the kingship of Christ. It's to be a school like that. So children should all go to school at home in the deepest possible sense. And the significance of it is that the Christian home or family is intended by God to be a microcosm of 
of the kingdom of God. So God's fatherhood is something that our children will primarily learn about from our fatherhood. I find that a great and solemnizing truth, but it's true. Our children will learn about God's fatherhood from our fatherhood. And I have talked long, long, long hours with young people who have been scarcely able to grasp the truth of the fatherhood of God because they have seen such a distorted picture of fatherhood in their home. You notice the same emphasis in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verses 4 and 5 where Paul is speaking about the realm of the overseer of God's church. He says he must manage his own family well and see that his children obey him with proper respect. And managing the family and managing the church of God are brought together and laid alongside each other. Now you see... Here is the area where we need to see Paul's injunction. The Christian home is intended to be a reflection of the kingdom of God. It's sometimes been pointed out, and I think helpfully, that God has appointed parents to be to their children the same three offices that he appoints Christ to in his kingdom. You will remember that Christ is appointed as prophet and priest and king. And God does appoint, the reformers spoke quite a bit about this, he appoints parents in their family to be prophets, priests and kings to their children. He appoints them as prophets to teach them. That's what we were reading about in Deuteronomy this evening in chapter 6. Did you notice that in that amazing passage? It's a very remarkable thing to read how God describes the type of home life that his people are to have. Listen to it. Impress these things on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road. Talk about this to your children. Talk about the things of God to them. My dear friends, that's the parent as a prophet. He is to teach his children. Sunday schools are a blessing beyond compare. Thank God for them and for Bible classes and every other sphere. But the place where children learn about God and the gospel is the home. If it's a Christian home. And so you need to talk about God. Talk about Christ. Talk about the things of God. I tell you the most sad thing that I ever see is the professing Christian home where parents and children are too embarrassed to speak about Jesus in a personal way. God says, talk about these things when you sit down and as you rise up. Speak to your children, say to them, the Lord brought us up out of the land of Egypt. That doesn't mean that you have a lot of the language of Zion and that your children learn it. That's the other side, I suppose, and I've seen that sometimes. You know, tiny little children telling me in the most extraordinary language of Zion about someone who has been saved and sanctified and so on. They haven't the faintest clue what it means. But I say to you, it's so important for us to talk with our children about the things of God. He makes parents prophets. He makes parents priests. And the chief ministry of the priest is to go into the presence of God on behalf of others and what the priest within his own family does. Every father is a priest within his family and his task within the family is to pray to God for his children, to cry to God that this kind of lifestyle might be written into the fabric of their character. And he's called to be a priest. And he is called in a very special sense to be a king. Not, let me say again, to be a despot, but to be one who on behalf of God rules his home with the law of Christ. So that in a home, the common thing to discover is what does God want? 
What is God's will? Is that the way our children are brought up, you see? So that the primary issue in our home is not what's going to be most profitable financially or economically, what's not not going to be most comfortable or most convenient, but what God wants, that's being a king in your own home. I remember a friend of mine who's a vicar in the Church of England telling me that his little boy was at school and uh, they were talking in the classroom with the teacher who was having a great conversation with the children, finding all sorts of things out about them, you know, as teachers do. And uh, they were having a general confession session about what their fathers did and who their father's bosses were and so on and who they took orders from. And my friend's little boy said to the teacher, My dad gets his orders straight from God. But you know, my dear friends, every Christian dad does. He gets his orders straight from God. And God appoints him in that sense as a king within that particular domain. Now that means, you see, that from their very earliest days, our children are to grow up recognizing who the real head of the house is. And that's uh, not uh, either mother or father. They will recognize that the real head of the house is Jesus. And that will be evident in every sphere of life. So, says the Apostle, fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. You know the great example of that training, which is instructing verbal instruction. And instruction is also disciplining The great example of that is Jesus in his own childhood development. Have you ever noticed in Luke chapter 2 the beautiful picture he gives to us of developing childhood? The very last two verses of Luke 2 when Jesus had had this misunderstanding with his parents, you know, and could so easily have been irritated by them. He went down to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. But his mother treasured all these things in her heart. And then he began to grow in that home. And do you notice the manner in which he grew in verse 52? He grew in intellectual development. Jesus grew in wisdom. He grew in physical development. Jesus grew in stature. He grew in spiritual development. Jesus grew in favor with God. And he grew in social development. He grew in favor with God and men. And that is an all-round growth. And it is that kind of bringing of children up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Now, let me say to you one or two things as we close. First, it may be that there are some of us here this evening who say that's just about the most painful thing anybody could tell me because I have found so much anguish in my own experience in bringing up children. And that is true of many godly parents that I know as well. And therefore they are not to reproach themselves and say, all this is my doing. Because in the mystery of God's providence and permissions that sometimes is the experience of godly parents. And it is a mystery and to the end of time will remain a mystery. Here's the second thing. Those of you who are not either parents or have the prospect of being parents, let me say to you that in the family of God you have an overwhelming duty 
to pray for those who are parents and to pray for the children within this flock that they will be brought up in such homes with such parents and such families. You need to pray about that yourself. And the third thing is this, that even though you are past the stage now of being merely a child and under the care and protection and dependence of your parents, there never will be a day until your parents are taken out of this world when it is not incumbent upon you before God to honor them. And it is one of the tragedies of our modern society, as is evidenced and witnessed in so many places that one sees, that people are not honoring their parents in this realm. And I say to you, we have a duty there which God will hold us to. Here, then, we have an evidence of being filled with the Spirit. My dear friend, are you demonstrating the fullness of the Spirit here? Is this a real burden on your soul that we might see in the church of God in our generation families like this, living like this, raised up? Because I believe there may be nothing more important in the whole world than precisely that. Oh, that there might be godly biblical homes out of which are produced godly biblical children. May we go on praying for it and laboring for it. Let us pray together. Our gracious God and Father, we thank you for all the perfections of your own fatherhood. And those of us who are fathers and mothers would confess to you the imperfections of our parenthood and acknowledge before you that so often we have misrepresented you to our children. Those of us who are children would confess before you the rebelliousness of our own hearts very often as you have set our parents over us in the name of God and we repent of that. Some of us have to confess to you a neglect to honor our parents even in their old age and we bow before you regarding that this evening. Lord, some of us may have little concern for homes and families and therefore discover that we are not concerned about the things that concern you. And we pray that you will touch our lives afresh this evening and give us an intense burden whether we have children or will never have them, that there may be raised up within this fellowship godly homes, godly children, who will grow to be servants of yours. We ask it all in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, and for his glory in our lives. Amen.